This is Solve It for Kids. Hello, my amazing and curious friends. My name is Jennifer, the Dean of all things STEM and STEAM, and this is Solve It for Kids. The podcast that gives kids and families a peek inside the real world of scientists, engineers, and experts as they solve problems in their jobs using creativity, cooperation, and critical thinking. And now please welcome to the show my podcast partner, Galactic Space Geek, Jeff Gagne. Hello, Jennifer, and hello, listeners. I don't know if Galactic Space Geek Jeff could get any more excited. (laughs) I say I'm excited a lot, but we have worked our way up the food chain, and this is going to be a truly exciting conversation. Yes, I wholeheartedly agree. What problem are we solving today? How can we see the universe in a new way? How can we see the universe in a new way? Ooh, this is a very intriguing question, Jeff. Who is our distinguished guest today? It is an intriguing question, and we have a guest with a unique perspective to answer it for (laughs) us. Today, we have the wonderful Dr. Thomas Zerbukin. He is the former Associate Administrator of NASA for the Science Mission Directorate. What does that mean? In his words, he was the head of science for NASA. He was also the longest tenured head of science for NASA. Welcome to the show, Dr. Z. Hey, glad to be here. Well, we are thrilled to have you. We are gonna talk so much science here in the next 30 minutes or so, but I have a question for you. Did you always want to study space and the universe ever since you were a little kid? That's a really good question. And I want to (laughs) tell you when I was a student just in a school in a mountain village in Switzerland, that's where my accent is from. I tried to lose it and I can't, but (laughs) but, uh, but in that little mountain village, I started reading a lot of books and they were all about exploration sometimes it was people getting on boats but sometimes it's about people building machines that explore and i loved in the mountains there the dark skies and looked at them and imagined how these skies would look if it could go there or if there's somebody else looking the other direction another boy (laughs) somewhere else yes thinking about the world that i'm sitting on that's amazing that's amazing And even as a young boy, you were already thinking about it in a different way than I imagine a lot of other people of, is there somebody else on the (laughs) other end looking back at me? Should I be waving up there? So were there specific stories that drew you into space science more than, say, the explorers that got on ships? When I was eight years old, I got to Christmas as a present from my godfather, a little book. Uh, Uh talked about missions and there was a mission it's called the voyager mission that was about to launch to go visit jupiter and saturn and neptune and uranus and kind of going far far away and it had a plaque that had a message for somebody else that could read it and so i was really looking at that i was looking at missions to to the moon the apollo program which uh, had just Started. I'm too young to kind of have a recollection of landing on the moon, but I, I yes. thought about this. And that book came with me as I went to the university and then eventually became the head of NASA. Wow. Wow. That's, that's fantastic. So the power of books, kids, everybody go out and read about all of these subjects. So how did you get into solar physics, right? Isn't that what your degree is in? Because that's kind of unique. How did you get into that? After I decided to go and study physics, which was a big leap because I didn't know a single physicist around me. Oh, (laughs) Uh, and uh, you know, so I uh, frankly, my good teacher encouraged me, it's like, just try, he said, which is a really good piece of advice. Just try when you have a big goal like this. And so I did that and I got into a university, and it just so happened that that university was actually building a space instrument for NASA. And, oh, wow. uh, and it was Whoa. a solar physics space instrument. And frankly, the uh, reason I did it 
is that the professor who told me, do you want to work on this? He stopped himself in the middle of the sentence and said, this is going to be really, really difficult. We don't have enough <laughs> time. And I said, can I try? <laughs> and so uh, so that instrument is still looking at the sun as we speak here wow. and collecting particles. And I built it when I was much, much younger. Oh, that's amazing. My goodness. Can you, just in case any of our listeners want to look it up, can you tell our listeners what instrument that is? Yeah, it's the WIND spacecraft, W-I-N-D, and it's looking at the particles from the sun. The sun is so hot, it blows away its atmosphere. You know, if the Earth was really hot, it would blow away our atmosphere. Thankfully, it's not, because we're breathing the atmosphere, but the sun is so hot, it's blowing away the atmosphere, and the spacecraft, the WIND spacecraft, is collecting those particles. Wow. And it's still up there working. Yes. That's fantastic. Yeah. So from solar physics and working on that, was it an immediate jump to, okay, I want to work at NASA so I can continue working on these types of machines? It was not immediate. Frankly, I did something very different in between. And that Uh, is that I learned how to build teams that uh, come up with good ideas. I built teams that built companies kind of perhaps it's an app for an iPhone or Android, or perhaps it's a new solution for clean energy. I learned how to build those teams and that turned out to be really important also. Yes, it's science, but it's also learning how to build teams. Exactly. So let's step into NASA and let's talk a bit about some of these machines that you helped to create, or I guess lead the teams to create, yes? Absolutely. And many of these, there are teams that are sometimes 50 people, but for the very biggest one, the biggest machine ever built, the biggest observatory ever built in space is called the James Webb Space Telescope. Over 10,000 people worked on that, men and women, old and young, uh, people from the United States, from around the world, 10,000 or more worked on it. That's amazing. And so how do you lead a team (laughs) that size? And that big, like all over the world. I think the most important way to think about it is it's like a big hike somewhere in the mountains. Uh, The most important thing to agree upon is which mountain you want to get to. Oh, it's really important (laughs) that everybody knows what you want to do. And of course, it's not just build a telescope. It's how long do we want to take building the telescope? How accurately does it need to be? And it turns out that telescope is really, really, really difficult. It is the most difficult mission ever done. It's the most expensive wow. mission ever done. But so everybody needs to be aligned, coming together. Then the second piece is, it's absolutely critical to understand that the only way you're getting there is we can rely on our partners. So this is yes. not one of yes. those people who kind of one hero is in charge of everything. It's one of those things where you lock your arms and it turns out the most important such telescopes, the most important such missions, and frankly, all the things that are worth doing, I think, are things you do together in teams. And and so so it really is learning how to build that team. So at the end, you trust each other, almost like in a sports team, kind of learning what everybody else's strengths and weaknesses are and build a winning team. Yes, exactly. So we've talked about that on the show before, about how science by definition, is diverse. And so the more people you have working together, you know, working on a particular team, come together for a goal. So tell us about some of the cool things that you learned while you were building the James Webb Space Telescope. So we were building it. Frankly, we had huge problems. And I remember (laughs) uh, Christmas... On Christmas Day 2021, we launched it into space. And I was there... And we were there as uh, in a tropical rainforest of French Guiana when the telescope right. disappeared into space. Wow. And since then, we've deployed that telescope. I just want to quickly just say how big it is, just so yes. everybody knows. Yes. Kind of the mirror, the big collecting mirror is 21 feet across. Or so think of three okay. men my size. I'm pretty tall, kind of wow. laying in a row. So it's kind of a, a honeycomb shaped kind of uh, area of that yes. far across. It's very, very cold. It's cooled down by five heat shields that are protecting it from from the heat of the sun. And those heat shields are the area of a tennis court. 
So oh my a God. Tennis oh, court wow. floating up there with a ginormous <laughs> mirror. And so that has been setting up. So let me just quickly tell you the images that we've collected uh, with yes. it are just breathtaking and oh. just amazing. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Jeff and I are big, big fans of the James Webb Space Telescope. <laughs> yes. So with that being such a difficult project and not just any one part of it being difficult, you know, some are, okay, what science are we going to do that science might be too hard or it might be too expensive for, you know, either Congress or the taxpayers or for NASA's budget. What is it like sort of navigating, juggling all of those balls when you are the head of science, not just the head of one mission? So the first and foremost part is to recognize that everybody is part of the team, including the people who are representing the taxpayers. And it's absolutely important that they're also feeling like they're part of the team. So for me, sometimes that, see... There's a famous proverb in Africa. It's like, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And and, and that is really what I've learned here. So it requires that you sit down. And sometimes there's a really uncomfortable discussion. But what you try to do as the leader is really making sure, first of all, you protect your people. So you never attack your people, even if you get attacked. But you bring together all the ideas that are there and and are not too proud to take ideas from others because uh, you want to work on the best idea, not your best idea. And so once you do that, you basically shape kind of a a consensus, a way to build the telescope that everybody can. It's not everybody's favorite solution, but everybody can, (laughs) can be okay with it. That, right. that's, everybody that's, can get on board. I was going to say, that's kind of life, is it? Isn't it when you go through life? You don't always get to pick your favorite solution, but sometimes it happens that way. Well, I'm curious. So you worked so hard on this and you spent so much money and, and all of these people. How did you feel that first day when those images started coming in? Can you share that with us? So the first time I saw it, I was in a room. It was not public yet. And by that time... There were very few wow. people that wow. had seen these images. And I basically sat in that room. And I remember kind of having tears in my eyes because wow. I thought back uh, both of the amazing team that built it, but I also sure. thought back of my little, kind of the little boy in the mountains, kind of not actually knowing what physics is right. and doing that. And I want to tell you, the universe is incredibly more beautiful than we ever imagined. And that's that's, that's what I felt. The picture that I looked at is part of our own galaxy. So if you ask how far away is, let me just quickly explain to you. So the sun you see in the sky, the light that hits your eyes took off by the sun about eight minutes ago. So, you know, uh, eight minutes ago, just imagine back roughly that time it took to get from the sun. So The picture that I saw, which I would call is kind of a stellar hospital. I want to explain later what that means. (laughs) Okay. The the picture that I saw, the light came 8,000 years ago. It took 8,500 years ago to be there. So it's really, really far away, much, much farther than the sun. Just for comparison, Jupiter is roughly 32 minutes away. So 8,500 years ago. Wow. So I call it a stellar hospital because there are two things that we can see there. It's on the one hand, the death of stars. Every star comes alive and dies and the stars kind of seed the environment with incredible material. They baked on the inside, but it's also a nursery. There's new stars forming right there. And it's one of the most beautiful images that hopefully we can actually put up on the post so I can show we, it. We absolutely will do that. Yes. And, and it really, that that image was just absolutely incredible. There was a second image which showed, it's, it's almost like a sand pile of galaxies. Mm-hmm. And what was amazing about this is there's one dot on there where the light took, now hang, you know, hold on to that, took <laughs> over 13 billion years wow. to come to us. So oh my gosh. From the edge, from the beginning of the universe, it took that light to come. And for the first time, we're seeing it. 
that's mind blowing, right? Like it's like, mind blowing that we can look that far back. Yeah. Wow. I can certainly understand why tears welled up in your eyes yes. for that. And I can only imagine what it would have been like to be in a small room with just a small team of yes. scientists to have seen that before it got announced out to the general public. Especially what a culminating moment. Especially ones that had worked for years and years and years to get to this point, right? Exactly right. And, and um, what, what it did to me, you know, first of all, I just had a sense of awe about the universe and its beauty right. and its magnificence. You know, every once in a while, I feel like a little fish in a big ocean, right? So, <laughs> yes, you know, yes. You, you, you can decide what, what would you prefer, right? Would you like to be in a fish tank, you know, that you know all the corners, every no. rock? I'd rather no. be in the ocean, right? So me it's too. a big, big, big ocean yep. and we're a little fish but we're part of that big ocean so the awe the sense of awe that comes from that is so overwhelming but also the sense of hope that that team yes. that struggled so much managed to do that miracle and build that telescope that it worked that just that's just such an experience that will forever change what i think is possible because a lot more is possible than we ever would think wow. i agree that, i agree and you just made the most perfect <laughs> transition for me. Not that I want you to leave the space science world that we're talking about, but recently just listened to your speech to the university RIT mm -hmm. and hope was a big part of that. Can you please speak more about hope and exploration and space science and right. the universe? So if we look at the world on a given day and you look at, let's say, news, whatever it is, mm. um, yes. there's a lot of challenges that come your way. I know yes. our planet, our kind of climate isn't doing so well, right? right. It's kind of where right. we have changed it. There are certain challenges, you know, kind of the last just five years, there were two so-called 500 level floods, 500 year level floods in Florida alone, which means that yes. normally you would expect the time between those to be like 500 years. Well, yes, <laughs> exactly. Years. That should not happen, right? Which means that the earth has a fever, right? And you just say, hey, for us to fix that, there's other issues that are just as hard, right? Yes. Of, uh, in, a, in communities, for us to fix that, many people need to come together and do the right things. Yes. And what I've seen using just the power of teams and the power of a vision, a power of that, again, the wow. aspiration of being yes. on that mountaintop, metaphorically speaking. For me, those two things together, a worthwhile goal and the power of teams, you can achieve some of the most important goals, even though they look hopeless at the beginning. And for me, that's why kind of doing, working at NASA, doing some of these incredible missions makes me feel very hopeful. Exactly. Yeah, I agree. Your speech is very inspiring. So we'll have a link for that on our website as well. But aside from the James Webb, which is an amazing, amazing accomplishment, you also were in charge of the team that had perseverance and ingenuity flying a helicopter on a completely different planet, which also gets, there's very little about space that doesn't get Jeff and I really excited and intrigued. But the ingenuity helicopter, how did that feel when it, yay, it took off, right? So the Ingenuity helicopter was a great experience just because, again, it seemed almost impossible. I remember when the team proposed yes. this, the head technologist of the center where they were basically told them, stop talking about it, it's impossible. <laughs> and of course, the answer is, no, it's not impossible. The helicopter has flown over 50 times uh, right. on the surface of, of Mars. And, and of course, what sometimes also happens, like after you see it fly for 50 times, you realize... People think it's easy. Uh, it's yes. incredibly hard. It's incredibly <laughs> yes. hard. And, yes. <laughs> and, and I remember when we tried for the first time, I was out there. The woman in charge of that helicopter, her name is Mimi An. Mm -hmm. she, uh, yes. she sat there next to me. And I want to tell you, the first time we tried to fly the helicopter, it did not work. Oh, and, okay. Uh, we had problems with the engineering with the software to be exact right got a right. helicopter okay. tried to fly but it stopped itself and it shouldn't have 
And I told, uh, you know, I told Mimi, it's like, everybody's like, we have a crisis. Like, absolutely not. You're already on Mars. There has never <laughs> been a helicopter on Mars. And you've made it the whole way. Of course, you're going to be successful. We'll give you time. And so we have to figure out and we figured right. out what the problem is. So I remember the second time we tried to fly, we were there and the helicopter just got up, you know, and just went up a few feet and landed again. Right. Yes. And, and we were all screaming <laughs> loud. <laughs> kind of, you know, like it's Wright Brothers moment of on a different planet. The exactly. first flight, yes. the first controlled flight. We are just so excited. And then, of course, it has flown many, many times. And we're now uh, building two more helicopters to actually do specific tasks that will launch to Mars later this decade. Wow. That's incredible. And when I learned more about the Ingenuity helicopter, as it was going, I kept reading in articles and things like that, that it was a test. It was essentially, I felt like the press, people that were reading or that were writing were trying to temper my hopes as a space fan <laughs> out in the world that this is a test we're not sure it's going to work and a to see it take off then to see it do 10 flights and 20 flights and now more than 50 flights and this is now a proven technology yeah. where you just said there's going to be two more that's fantastic how can you see NASA moving forward, not just with helicopters, but with the idea of running these test missions in reality out in the solar system that may or may not work, but if they do, the return on investment is incredible. Yeah, I think it's a really profound point. I, frankly, as the head of science, I tried very hard. I basically made a rule and said, every single mission needs to have a new technology. Ah, okay. And for me, sometimes it's not because it, something hangs from the mission. Perhaps we launch a little, you know, a little satellite with it, which has a new technology. Okay. But these tech demos, just like you said, these tech tests, you know, the demonstrations of an entirely new technology need to become part of what we're doing in a much more regular fashion. Yes, the way I always right. think about it, we have a box of things we know how to do. And yes. it's every mission's task, not only to use that box, but put a tool more back into the box. So oh, I love that. the next like person that. that comes kind of has more opportunities, has more options. And I think that's really critical to dare that, right? Kind of, yes, it's easy to do the same thing over and over again, but it does not enhance our capabilities. It does not enhance our horizon. Exactly. So that kind of leads into, I'm sure the famous saying, you know, failure is not an option. And everybody says that with NASA, but can you explain why it's okay to fail? Because I end up talking to students and quite honestly, some of my friends about how it's okay to fail. Yeah, the word failure is not an option. That expression comes from the Apollo 13 mission. And it was yes. the rallying cry of Gene Kranz, who was in charge of the operations team that actually brought the Apollo 13 mission back. And he, right. he had a rallying cry that basically said, for this mission with the lives of these astronauts on board, failure right. is not an option. Now, I want to tell you, whether it's with astronauts or with missions, Failure is an ever-present possibility. For me, sure. for me, that rallying cry, which was exactly the right thing to say, should never be taken as a, to mean that we should never fail. If you want to do big things, if you want to fly on Mars, if you want to observe the Earth in a new way, if you want to move a celestial object out of the way, like we yes. did, what you want is recognize <laughs> that failure is a possibility and you do yes. it anyway, because it's so worth doing that it would be too bad for us to not even try. So exactly. failure is a possibility. And the most successful careers, the most successful missions have some challenges, have some yes. failures. And yes. that's success. And you could build a mission that has never had a problem, never had a failure, but be not successful because it did not move forward. Oh, you could, the, true. The life, it's not a, our goal to live a life without mistakes. It's our goal <laughs> no. to live a life that has impact. To, and so failure as part of that is an ever-present possibility. Yes. 
with that, what an excellent explanation of that. I would like to ask you if you would share a failure during your time as the head of science with NASA, something that maybe caught you off guard. Sometimes, you know, you're reaching for a goal so big that the chances of failure are larger that what was something that happened during your time that was just a, like, man, I really, I was sure we were going to get this done, but it looks like it's not going to happen. So we had a number of different failures, but I want to talk about one. And that had Mm -hmm. to do with a mission called Tropics, made out of six very small spacecraft. See, small spacecraft is a big idea. Because small spacecraft are a lot cheaper than big spacecraft. You can develop them a lot faster. And then the question is, if you have the small spacecraft, how do you put them into space? Because you never want to, you know, it's like you never want to pay somebody to deliver your package that's worth five bucks for 500 bucks. So in other words, (laughs) the rocket cannot be. So the rocket, if the spacecraft is small, the rocket also needs to be small. And some of these rockets just aren't that well understood or well proven. Yes. So, so we actually launched the spacecraft two by two. And so okay. we wanted three launches and the first launch blew up. So it, oh, uh, wow. it went up, it went up. And frankly, it looked really great. The pictures look really great. But as it was trying to deliver the final spacecraft really up there with its secondary motor up there. Right. Uh, the motor did not have enough fuel, so it never made it up. With an hour, the spacecraft fell into the ocean back home. Oh, the, man. Uh, uh. And, and so the question is, what now? Uh, so, <laughs> yeah. so, so, so first and foremost, we had designed the mission such that we only needed four spacecraft. And just okay. to tell you, the other four are up there now. So, oh, so okay. So, but the second thing that also happened is... The missions are small enough that there are actually private companies who are building these spacecraft. Okay. So those kind of spacecraft, because they're helping the Earth, they're helping us understand better predictions for big storms, hurricanes. So that's what they're for. And I remember as I was being beat up online and by some people, (laughs) I I wasted. Because you failed. Yeah, because I wasted money. The CEO of that company called me and said, look, you can have the data. We're building 12 of those. You can have the data. And so you can fill in your gaps, even for the two you've lost. Wow. Uh, because that's a really good thing. So kind of my wow. point is, yes, it was a failure. The spacecraft into the ocean. But if you look at it, they stand back from it. It was an investment into a future that's much bigger. And yes. it's going to be much more impactful than not even trying. Yes, right. exactly. Exactly. You know, and then I'm curious, what did you think, or maybe you weren't around when this was first asked, but about trying to move an asteroid? Like, where did that idea come? Wasn't that one of the ones people were like, what? Yeah, I remember. I remember <laughs> it's actually one of the first missions I sold to Congress, right? So I came in to my job and I saw this mission and they had been working on it. And I just felt like it spoke to my inner gamer. Right. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so it's like, you know, it's like, okay, so can we actually move a celestial object? And then the answer is you take a spacecraft and you bump it into it with full force. Right. And you see whether you can change the velocity. And of course, again, there, this is actually really hard, right? It, it's almost like playing yes. golf across the United States and doing a hole in one. When you, you know, you tee off in Washington, D.C., and it arrives in, you know, in, in Los Angeles, right? So kind of you right. need a lot of <laughs> get there, but you need to be really, really accurate. So, wow. so it's that kind of thing. Yes, uh, we were not sure it's going to work 100%. As we got closer and closer, especially the last hour, I sat there as the spacecraft was sending. <laughs> yes. Data. By the way, one detail about this, the object we hit, we had never seen. We had never, so we knew it's wow. an asteroid and around it is a smaller asteroid. We want to hit the small one. Right, right. A bump. It's so small, we've never seen it on any telescope. So we only saw it for the first time one and a half hours before we hit it. Oh, oh my wow. gosh. So all the, where it was exactly and how big we thought it was, 
uh, we derive from the wobbles of the bigger body going back and forth because it right it, it oh by the little body. But, but so we had that and, and sure enough where we thought it would be it was and, and it was just in time because if we had seen it too late we actually don't have enough fuel in the tank to turn the spacecraft around to go hit it so, so i mean it, the, okay. The, all I can think of is sports analogies, like the odds makers. Like someone would have made millions on that, right? What are the odds we're actually <laughs> going to hit that? Yeah. Oh yeah. my goodness. So right now, Doctor Z is talking about the Dart mission. Yes. And I can only imagine having been in the room with you. For I am fascinated with the video and the images that are released yes. to the public approaching that asteroid and you can see right up to that moment of impact yes what was it like to be in that room did you know you were going to hit it before you hit it <laughs> and like happy were you that you actually hit it and didn't miss it <laughs> yes so first of all i thought the likelihood of that was relatively high once we were there. We actually had right. quite a number of challenges on the way. But once we were okay. there, I sat there and basically it never made me nervous. So in other words, the spacecraft ah. was correcting exactly like it should. It was like, we just okay. sat down here and wow. watched and the spacecraft was steering really well. I was nervous before that. But once I sat there, it looked like it was going down the middle, right? Kind of okay. doing a, a bullseye wow. and it looked really good. The thing that made me, that was a really meaningful thing, was the person in charge of that whole system, that engineering system. And the woman who was there on camera was my former student when I was a professor. Oh, that's oh. awesome. Oh, great. Yes. So it felt just so amazing because we're making history, you know, again, for the first time, humanity deliberately nudged a celestial object out of the way. But we did it with a woman, again, I managed wow. to help educate. And so for me, but by the way, the guy next to her was also one in my classroom. Uh, way back. <laughs> so just, oh, there just, you go. Just so you know, I think one thing that I just want to mention, what we had done before we hit the object, we actually had released a very small spacecraft. Remember how we talked about tech demos? Yes. You know, crazy thing. So, yes. so when I put the mission in the budget, I basically said, I will put the mission in budget one condition. We're going to try to take a picture of the impact because I want yes. to see the picture. Okay. Right? Yes. Yes. So, yes. So we actually put a little satellite that's only as big as a loaf of bread, you know, wow. a big oh loaf gosh. of bread or a big toaster. And we chattened it. And, and frankly, what happened within a day of that, we had the pictures and we had it. We had seen that kind of impact oh, wow. from not yes. only with the camera that, of course, died once we hit it, but also with right. another camera. And then what we learned also with the ground-based observatories, the whole world was watching yes. and was seeing kind of what happened with that celestial body, which nobody had seen before. All of a sudden, it became like a comet. It had a long tail across the sky. It was absolutely incredible. It was the amazing. The images were amazing. Yeah. And the extra camera that you were talking about when those pictures were released after the initial, even as Galactic Space Geek, there's so many things that I just don't know everything that's going on. I was fascinated to see a different view. And I can only imagine that your inner gamer must have been so excited <laughs> that that exterior POV of, yeah, we just caused that explosion right there. Yeah, and, uh, I exactly felt that way. Of course, again, when I asked people to put a small spacecraft on, the team told me it's not possible. Oh, and I basically <laughs> said, well, make it possible, right? I mean, you know, like, you know, like sometimes something looks like a miracle. It looks like yes. absolutely yes. incredibly impossible. And if you put your mind to it, and especially if you put a team together, you know, in this case, the team was made up of Italians and Americans as well. So they made this happen. And it's just absolutely fun to see it work, despite the people. I think I, and sometimes I, I rub it in. It's like, remember how you <laughs> told me it's not possible? <laughs> yeah, I think when people say to you, it's not possible, that to you, you see that as a challenge, I'm guessing. Exactly uh, right. Yeah. Like a hurdler, right? Okay, let's jump over it. Yeah. Exactly. So, okay. So 
what would you tell kids these days who want to get into space exploration? How many different ways are there to do it? Like, say, for example, they don't want to be a scientist or maybe an engineer. Is there like where should they start? So first and foremost, there has never been a time where there, in the whole history of humanity when there is more opportunities to go into space science or yes. into space exploration. And, and it's all off the fence. You could be an astronaut. We just broke the record with the most people in space at a given time with multiple units, professional astronauts from NASA, Japan, China, but also commercial astronauts yes, uh, that are also up there, right? And so that's going to increase. So you could be doing that. You could be a scientist and an engineer, of course, building this, but you could also be an artist. You could be part of analyzing the budgets that make this happen. You could wow. be a writer because what we're really trying to do is write some of these stories we talked about and we need, you could be a video artist uh, that helps us visualize. You could be, right. we really feel that kind of the future of space exploration, even more so than today is, uh, again, will continue to be a team sport, but a team that's much, much bigger than the team that got us here. That's fantastic. Yes. I love all of those things. (laughs) (laughs) So I know Jennifer is getting close. I would like to ask, sir, you have left your position as the head of science at NASA. Any indication since you've had some time now as to what is next for Dr. Z? Also, what I've been trying to do is kind of tell some of these stories because I think it's worthwhile telling the stories And I've done that. I'm also helping others. You know, I just, frankly, I just came back from a lunch with one of my mentees. Then I sat down with her for like two hours and, you know, a person who is building her career still, right? And then, and I'm looking for kind of where to apply what I've learned. I'm looking very hard, especially at problems that relate to our climate. You know, like how could I help uh, come up with solutions? But there's other things as well. So I just... Once I see it, I will know. I just really haven't found it yet. In the meantime, I'm just going to continue trying to help as best as I can, learn as much as I can, but also tell stories. Well, I certainly hope that someone tells you, as soon as you find what's really going to be next, I hope someone tells you that it's impossible because (laughs) you seem to have quite the track record for proving those folks wrong. There you go. That would be amazing. Well, this has been a fabulous conversation. But before we let you go, I want to know if you have a challenge for our listeners, Dr. Z. I'd like to do uh, everybody who's listening, uh, learners of all ages, I'd like to have them spend an hour of their time and go to a dark place and look at the sky and just look at the worlds up there and just imagine the huge sky. We're going to put some images up. Kind of those are the worlds that are out there. Just imagine that for each star you're looking at, there's at least one planet that is there. Something we learned in the last 10 years. Each one of those worlds out there has organics that are at the base, kind of the building blocks of of life. And, And just imagine how beautiful it is. If you just wait there for a little bit, you will see things move. That reminds yes. me that, <laughs> that sometimes it's uh, something we put up there, like the space station. Sometimes it's a meteor or something right. like that. But it reminds yep. you that the sky is changing. So yes. look at the dark sky and wait for something to change because the sky, just like we all are, is changing and we're part of it. Oh, that's very inspiring. Yes, Love I'm going to do that. Now I have to find a place without light around me, right? In order to really, truly see that. Well, this has been a fabulous conversation. We're so honored you joined us today. Thank you for being on Salt for Kids, Dr. Z. Thank you, Dr. Z. Thanks to you both. And thanks for telling the stories of science (laughs) and encouraging others to build their own stories. Wow. We really could talk to (laughs) Dr. Z for as long as he would stay on our podcast. Oh, my goodness. How exciting was that? Absolutely. It was so His exciting. challenge. <laughs> what did I say in the intro of a unique perspective? Go outside, yep. look up at the night sky for an hour. When is the last time, unless you happen to be an astronomer or an astrophotographer, when is the last time you did that? But he followed it up with the wonderful watch until something changes. 
Yeah, I love that. I love that, and I love how he started kind of doing that when、yes. he was a kid, and he still does that、yes. all of these years later, and all of these accomplishments that he's done. I mean, I couldn't even imagine being on one of these amazing projects that he ran, let alone all of them. And then also, I love, love the fact that he talks all about the team. It's all about working together. That this is what science is. STEM is all about working together, and that was just so amazing. So if you guys do this, go outside, you know, lay on the ground, or you know, sit in a chair, whatever, and look up and watch what's happening. Tell us what you see. We would love to hear、Absolutely. from you. Absolutely. You can find us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. We are at Kids Solve and. Don't forget to check out our website, solveforkids.com, where we have a page for every episode, and this page is going to be chock full <laughs> of amazing technology that NASA developed and that Dr. Z himself. This on. is absolutely an episode to be listened、yeah. to more than once. Go back, Dr. Z's、yes. views and how he sees the universe. Having led、yep. science for all of NASA with so many different exploration missions that are out there, both with the Earth and beyond, there is so much、yep. that we can continue learning and growing. And we definitely want to know what you see change in this challenge. Until next time, you'll hear Jen and Jeff on solve, solve it, it for, for kids. kids.